Dan Borvin, hey. how, are, how are you, brother? Great. Good to um, good to always have you on the program. Um, the regular Dan Borvin, the Dan Borvin. The. <laughs> I did not go to the Ohio State <laughs> University. I went to the Moody Bible Institute, <laughs> which is equally prestigious. Yeah. Moody Bible Institute, unlike Ohio State, undefeated in football. <laughs> yeah. Never had a football team, but still undefeated. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, we've uh, we were discussing before you came. I mean, as you came, when you came, um, what we talk about today. And sometimes it's kind of hard to figure that out. <laughs> so there's so many things to talk about when it comes to Christian ministry, gospel, Bible, all these things. But one of the things that you know we think is really important for our day is the subject of leadership. Leadership in the church, leadership among as elders and deacons and pastors. I don't know that this gets the sort of treatment that it should. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not good treatment. Not good treatment. You can treatment. sell a lot of books on leadership, but yeah. most of them are not worth reading, sadly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean it, it meant a lot uh to the apostle when he said appoint elders in every city. You're really not going to have a healthy or a good church. I've always said a church is as strong and as united as its leadership. So yeah. whatever we see in the leadership, whatever's going on in the leadership, that's just a microcosm of the macrocosm. In other words, you're going to have a good sense of what's going on in the congregation. Yeah, Leadership's united. It's healthy. All pistons are firing well. You're going to see a lot of good health in the life of a congregation. And that's that's just a good principle of leadership, right? And I think the flip side is even more true because you can't have good leadership and, you know, we live in a fallen world, so right. it doesn't guarantee. Yeah, it's not automatic. Right. But bad leadership pretty <laughs> much does guarantee yeah. serious problems. Serious problems. Yeah. Like we can't underestimate how serious. Um, and that's what we want to talk about today, a range of subjects that sort of come under this general category of Christian leadership, leadership as office bearers, leadership in the church. And on another episode, we'll talk about leadership as men <laughs> in our culture. <laughs> but um, I thought to kind of open it today, First Peter provides us a really good um, passage to help us think through this, the sort of weight of the calling. Uh, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. What a, what a loaded passage. You know? and, and encouraging us to take seriously this great, and we have to say privilege, right? It's a privilege to be set apart by Christ to lead his flock to lead in his church. And um, one of the things that I think is challenging is, is, is to think about, you know, the qualifications, but also the, the very motivation of it. I'm always amazed that when you have the qualifications for this, the first thing it says, if anyone desires, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's never the one that, that's always the thing that kind of gets overlooked, right? We're constantly looking for leaders and you go to somebody and, you know, it may be that they have the gifts and are confident that they have the gifts and you have right. to, you have to shepherd them through that. But there should be an aspiration. There should be something in a man that desires because he's been given this gift and calling by the Lord to shepherd the flock. And I think that's important up front to remember in this calling. Yeah. And if, if a man doesn't desire it, well, that's fine. Yeah. We'll find one who does. Right. We don't want to coax and cajole a guy into being an elder or a pastor or something. It should be as Paul said, you know, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. So I think it was Spurgeon who said, if you can do anything else, do it instead of becoming a pastor. Because if you have that out in when the dark times come, you're going to take it. Yeah. So before you get into the ministry, if there's anything else that you're interested in that you could do and you're not totally convinced, yeah. then yeah, don't go, don't go in the ministry. Right. But it has to be a man who desires this office. Right. And the flip side of that is he has to be chosen by God. Mm -hmm. This is not something that we decide ourselves. So there should be that internal call we talk about, like, mm -hmm. I, I desire to do this. I want to preach the gospel, but I'm not sure necessarily. 
if I am called by God, so then, of course, we talk about the external call that's confirmed by the church. Yes, we see this in you as the pastors and elders of the church. We believe God has placed this call on your life. But this is not a choice, just like you're going to choose to be a computer programmer or a plumber. Mm -hmm. This is chosen for us, a unique vocation, unlike anything else. And and we have to remember that, again, when the dark times come. Right. Right. If it's my choice, well, then I can go do something else. If it's God's choice, I'm stuck. Right. He chose me. I can't run. Right. And it shouldn't be something that, you know, is we are coercing people into, uh, you know, Peter does say here, it should be willingly. It should be something that's willingly done. And um, I think that demonstrates sort of the, the nature of the calling that there is this desire that the Lord puts on the heart of his, of those whom he is setting apart to lead. Um, out of great respect and understanding of the privilege to shepherd the flock of God, which was purchased by the blood of Christ. So there comes, it comes with a weighty calling. It's a, it's a, and maybe that's something we have to help people through. A lot of people I know when they first come in, you know, they say, I, I just don't think um, I have the necessary qualifications. We may think they do, but they don't. And they take very seriously the weight of the calling to shepherd the flock of Christ, right? And I think that's a healthy place no, to be. No, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, nobody lives up to this. Right. Perfectly. Paul said that. Exactly. Yeah. Who's sufficient? You look at the qualifications for elders and deacons. Yeah. I don't think I live up to this. Yeah, nobody does. Mm-hmm. That's a good sign. Yeah. If a guy comes in and yeah, thinks, I yeah, I pretty much have that down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whoa. Let's, uh, maybe we need a different <laughs> conversation. What did Thomas Sowell say? Um, anyone who loves meeting should never be in charge of oh. it. You know, so, <laughs> so it's kind of like, church, it, it's, I'll preach for free, but you have to pay me to go to meetings. <laughs> what is with these people? I, I love them. But people who go to like classic, classes meetings, presbytery meetings, general assembly. Yeah. For fun. I know. I That's like it. their energy throughout the year. It's like looking forward to the meetings. I've never gone know? to a meeting for fun. I, ca- I, I have to be there. <laughs> if I don't have to be there, I got better things to do. <laughs> Lloyd Jones talks about in Preachers and Preaching, there are just certain types wired this way. I don't get it. And um, I'm not wired. They, 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 I'm not either. I think I'm allergic to meetings. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I need like a Benadryl before I go like, into a meeting. That's one of the reasons I like to lead <laughs> meetings is because yes. I'm going to make sure they move. Absolutely. And we're not staying there beyond when, you know, what we should. I've always said <laughs> meetings should be conducted standing up. <laughs> Somehow the irrelevant <laughs> topics disappear right. when you're uncomfortable yeah. and tired. Yeah. Make them a little uncomfortable. Yeah. The yeah. chairs should not be, we're not going to meet in a recliner. <laughs> <laughs> we need uncomfortable chairs in a, a, too, yeah. a too cold room. Right. You don't want a too hot room. Then everybody's going to sleep. <laughs> room should be cold. So we get to business and get out. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. But I think this underscores, especially in our climate, the importance that we give attention to this subject, because it's not an easy time to shepherd in Christ church with all that's happening, all the pressures. And, and, you know, we're in this sort of hypersensitive culture on every issue. We really need godly men in these positions. And you mentioned up front when we have, you know, and we're in a very sensitive culture that's responding in, in, in many ways, rightly so. Right. Although some of the charges I think um, can be false and, yeah, it's used abusively. The abuse charge is something to take seriously. Absolutely. We, we need we need men who are going to love Christ's church and not bring shame on it. And their character does matter. Like their character is really important. There's a reason those qualifications are there. And not just character, but judgment and discernment. Wisdom. Yes. Right. Because you can be the most rock solid character guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you have poor discernment. That's right you can find yourself in a lawsuit. Yeah. And this is the context we're in. This is the context. We don't have to like it. Right. This is reality. Right. It should not be that way. Okay. There are a lot of things that should not be that way, but this is where we are. So we have to deal with it on its terms. Right. So we would be fools to ignore this context that we find ourselves in. And one thing we say to new elders and deacons, obviously, you conduct yourself appropriately in every context, but especially around women and children. Mm-hmm. Amen. Again, you could be perfectly innocent, the best character guy in the world, but if you make a foolish decision around women and children, it can be cataclysmic. 
So we have to be extremely cautious in how we conduct ourselves right. with the members of our church. Yeah. Should it be that way? Well, maybe not, but that's reality. We're in a Me Too world. Mm-hmm. We're in the world where everybody's suspicious. Everybody's got a cell phone camera. Right. So we have to be aware of our conduct at every moment, especially on the Lord's Day at the church. Right. This is this is really important. That above reproach, you know, emphasis in scripture is is as important as it ever has been, but it's really important for our moment. Yeah. Um, we have to be that. And Paul, Paul highlights the two areas that that has to be so. It has to be so in our doctrine, right? What you believe matters, um, what you confess matters to promote the spirit of unity and the bond of peace, our unity. We're going to get into some of these subjects here in a minute. Our unity is very important on these issues, but also our life. Yeah. You know, we can't be, the reality is we all have a measure of hypocrisy. Everyone has a measure of hypocrisy. Then there's just gross hypocrisy, yeah. right? That is just contrary to what it even means to be a Christian. And this is especially a danger be, because for leaders, I mean, let's face it, this is the way the apostles talked. We're not so postmodern that we reject the kind of language the apostles used. There are serious satanic assaults on this. There are serious um, demonic warfare on this particular thing we're doing. <laughs> and it, when he can undermine a pastor or he can take out a pastor for some moral failure or he can, you know, use a, a office bearer like an elder or deacon out in his life who's living completely hypocritically in light, you know, totally contrary to what the calling is, that does untold damage on the church. Yep. So these are the kind of things that we, you know, when we come in, we are looking to the Lord for grace and help and humility that we would conduct ourselves worthy of this great calling that God's given to us. Yeah, we have to be wise. So just back to the women and children thing, we have to have parameters in place to protect us, not just from falling into temptation, but from false accusations. Mm-hmm. Because a false accusation can be as damning and as damaging right. as a genuine one. Right. It doesn't have to be true to destroy a church, to destroy your reputation. Mm-hmm. So we tell our guys, don't ever be alone with a woman who's not your wife. Yeah, that that's come under criticism in our in our culture. And I, I think it's good to talk about that for a minute. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I think that was what the Billy Graham rule. Yeah. Um you know, Somehow Mike Pence co-opted it, but yeah, come on, dude. I thought it was the, you the Billy Graham. Yeah. <laughs> he invented it. <laughs> I mean, there's just wisdom in this. I don't, I, I'm, yeah. I mean, it takes, especially in counseling situations. I mean, yes. when you're dealing with people's lives and you're dealing into, you're diving into the deep problems in people's lives, when you have to give spiritual counsel, often that counsel is not received. And that counsel, if especially if somebody's choosing sin, all it takes is a charge or some kind of claim against against the man uh, that could that could you know ruin him. Now the Bible says these things may happen that you are spoken against falsely for the name of Christ. That does happen, um, and you are attacked and persecuted falsely. But we don't want to invite and make that situation easy, right? That's just exactly. wisdom. That's just wisdom. We do this in pairs. We, we come together as elders and we, uh, we discern who is best for a visit, uh, wh- what sort of person should be handling a particular counseling situation, how it should be ha- handled, and that there's good accountability so that these sort of things, I see so much foolishness on this point in the church. No thought is even given to this. People are either, I think they're just naive. They don't, well, I would never do something like that. So why would I have to worry about it? Yeah. But yeah. again, the false accusation can take down anybody. Right. So protect yourself. Right. It's so simple. Mm-hmm. And what are, you, what are you really losing by bringing someone else with you in meeting with a woman? Right. I was just reading some theologian way back, who, way back who was saying this. So it was before Billy Graham. And yeah. it was a reform. It was a reform guy. <laughs> Maybe he should so, get credit. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I should have written it down because now I'm blanking. Anyways, that's what happened when you get old. But also not only just meeting with women alone, but even physical contact. Right. I don't initiate a hug yeah. with a woman. Right. And even when I do, even when someone hugs me, and usually, you know, usually they're over 70. Yeah. Like the older ladies like the hugs. That's okay. But I make sure that I'm as stiff as plywood so that I have the most uncomfortable hug that you can receive. So you only really want one. You're not going to go back for another one yeah. with me. Yeah. So that this doesn't become a thing. Yeah. The touchy feely pastor is just beware. Yeah. Beware. 
So let's talk about some of the, the uh, challenges and responsibilities of office bearers in light of the things we've sort of set up here. But let's start, let's start with criticism. Um, criticism in how we handle a deal with, you know, criticism in the flock and conflict. I mean, a lot of guys come in and they have no idea. Now there, there's two sort of things. Conflict's going to come. Yeah. Like th there's no getting out of the call. This is what Paul was saying the whole time. Listen, if you have to reprove, admonish, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and patience, that's going to bring a measure of conflict. You're, there's a reason he describes office bearers as enlisting in, in a war, and he is, as a soldier, a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be battle. You're dealing with the spiritual souls of people. You're fighting for the souls of people. And you're just dealing with sinners. You're Wait, dealing with even sinners. Even apart from all the, the right. spiritual warfare. You put a bunch of sinners in one room. Yeah. Shocking. There's conflict. <laughs> just, just go on social media if you don't believe it. Right. Um, so, you know, we have to we have to think about how best to handle criticism and to realize that it is going to come. Um, I think this this gets to engagement. You can avoid a lot in the ministry if you disengage. There are there's the challenge as pastors and as elders to disengage from shepherding. And, the, and, and listen, that'll save you a lot of hardship. It just will. Yeah. If you're disengaged, you're not walking among the flock, you're not overseeing, you're not shepherding, um, that disengagement will free you up um, to do your own thing. But those who are engaged, and, and there's the opposite danger on the other side of the ditch, right? You can over-engage and bring all kinds of problems on yourself. But engaging in people's lives and overseeing them is something that we are called to do yeah. and to speak truth to them and love and help them. But conflict's going to come. Sheep are dirty. Yeah. If you're the shepherd, you're going to get dirty with your sheep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can run from your sheep and be disengaged and never get dirty, but you're not going to know your sheep that way. You're not going to feed them properly. You're not going to care for them as they need to be cared for. So yeah, you're, you're going to get some dirt on you right. when you get amongst your sheep. But that's the job. That's the job. So how do we handle it? Um, you know, I think when I first was going into ministry years ago, you know, you go to seminary and you, you get trained to how to preach the scriptures, read the scriptures, understand the scriptures. But I, I felt like when I first went in, I was very idealistic that I could come in and solve all these problems. <laughs> you know, like, so I jumped into situations like thinking I'm the pastor um, I'm going to, I'm going to charge right in here. And I made matters worse. Like I made matters worse because I wasn't, we weren't, I wasn't functioning and learned to function thinking, okay, number one, we'll talk about pastors here. I wasn't, I wasn't assisting the elders in the shepherding of the congregation, yeah. which is an important principle, but I was taking matters into my own hands thinking that I could, I Superman. could solve this. Yeah. Super pastor, you know, <laughs> and I got beat down. That did go well, huh? Did not go well. And part of that was my own doing right? Like, you know, you step into a mud fight, you're going to get mud on you, right? So, um, you know, but then I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I learned how to take criticism well. Mm. A lot of young idealistic guys go into ministry or maybe even office bearers and they face the, the criticism, they face the conflict and they take it personally. And, and then they don't, they don't know how best to handle the sheep who are maybe attacking them, me, maybe making charges against them. Why doesn't or, everybody love me? Yeah. My mom loves me. Yeah. Why exactly. doesn't everybody else love me? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's a shock, yeah. especially a lot of guys. That's why, you know, I often tell young guys who've gone maybe from Christian school to a Christian college yeah. to a seminary, yeah. and then they go straight into the pastorate or they want to, at least maybe you should work a real job. Yeah. yeah. I told one guy years ago, like, he was in that position. He he asked me, this was, this was not unsolicited advice. It was solicited advice. So I was okay. I think in giving it to him, I, he said, what should I do? I said, you should go work construction. Yeah. Yeah. You should have someone cuss you out on a job site so that you understand how your congregation feels in their jobs that they hate. This is really, this is really helpful. They don't want to go to their yeah. jobs. Yeah. They're miserable. They come to church on Sunday. They're beat up all week. Yeah. How can you relate to them? Mm -hmm. How can you speak to them? when you have no connection with any of that. And yeah. if you've been beat up metaphorically 
figuratively, maybe literally on a job site, <laughs> criticism from somebody saying your sermon wasn't so hot on Sunday. <laughs> it's going to kind of roll off your back. <laughs> you do. What did Van Tilly used to say? I think you need the skin of a rhinoceros. Yeah. And when he said you first step into the ministry, 10% of the people won't like you. Yeah. So that That's just goes bad. with the territory. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe mine was 20. 90%. percent you know? i pretty yeah. good with that. <laughs> so, um, but it's absolutely true. My first, my first in college, I, I, I like your point because my, I remember I worked as I, I played college basketball and I did this um, job for beverage distributing company, which was Coors, you know, so I delivered beer as a, they Were call you smoking the bandit. They call, they call, they call <laughs> I was a lumper. You know what a lumper is? A yeah. lumper was the guy who helped the driver. So uh, I get in this environment of these truckers who are going around delivering, delivering beer. Yeah. I had no idea people talked. That's that the way. real deal, baby. Like, I, I mean, and then the boss called me in one time and just laid into me. I was so angry. Like I could have punched the guy, right? Those are the blows I kind of needed. Yeah. You know, to like, to recognize how sinners are. Right. And that when we get in the church, you may not have all the bad language, but you certainly, certainly can have all the bad anger. Right. Right. And how to handle ourselves. And I think part of this is, well, if I have made, and you've made any maturity in this, you begin to look at people and understand that whatever they're facing, whatever reason they are attacking, you begin to understand that internally within them is something that they need that they don't have right. and they need help with instead of always taking it personally, right? Sometimes you should take it personally, Sometimes. you know, because it might be legit criticism. It might be legit. This is what yeah. we've, we've kind of, I think some, some people have swerved to the opposite end. Like, yeah. Well, people will just nitpick at you, so you just have to not take it personally. Well, yeah, maybe sometimes you should because you might need it. It might yeah. be true criticism. Yeah. So the first thing I think anytime I tell guys like you get criticized, well, look for the element of truth in it because yeah. there might be something that you could right. improve in yourself. That's really wise. That yeah. is there. Now, maybe it wasn't packaged so well. Maybe there's a bunch of other untruths accompanying it, yeah. but there's probably something in there that would benefit you. Yeah. But then, yeah, the flip side is especially if someone is lashing out or, you know, obviously criticizing in a, in a critical way, a sinful way. Yeah. What's behind this? Mm -hmm. You know, is there something, a deeper need that the person has and it's manifesting itself in this way. So don't, don't take it personally and don't get caught up in the details. I mean, we see this with every kind of conflict, you know, what's the real issue? And oftentimes it's hard to get there, but if we are wise and discerning, usually we can peel through the distractions and get to the real issue and address mm -hmm. that. Not easy. Yeah. It's easier said than done, but the hard work has to be done to get there. Yeah. I had, I had early in my ministry, a godly elder. He got in my face. I did, I did something, said something that really troubled him and he got in my face and I had to, I, I stood back from it. At first I was, I was really troubled by it. I stood back from it and said, you know what he's saying is right. Like this guy had the courage to actually say it in our culture, you know, where nobody says anything. Right. Right. This They'll guy, just tweet about it. Yeah. He actually, this elder actually had, and his best interest was my best interest, right? Our best interest together were the good of Christ's church. Yeah. And so I was able to stand back from that and recognize I needed that. And maybe he didn't present it in the best way possible, yeah. Yeah. but you took the truth from it. Mm -hmm. And, and used it to improve. I had the best relationship with him. That's great. After, still to this day, one of my dearest friends. But Faithful um, are the wounds of a friend. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If someone's willing to do that, praise God for that person in your life, right? Um, but more often than not, um, we, take, we take, things, take things personally. Yeah. You know? And um, I think one of the, the beautiful things is the way that Jesus called, if he called us to love our enemies, how much... Sometimes more difficult to love Christians, you know? so, uh, but to love Christians, to think about it, you know, um, I'm not controlled by what people do to me because I have a bigger aim in what I'm trying to accomplish with right. them, right? The, the worst thing we do is dig down in these situations and forget what our goal and purpose is in ministry. And if you can keep that in front of you, and then my greatest help, Dan, in ministry was I had... I had somebody who troubled me early on and I didn't think the criticisms were just, I didn't think it was handled well. 
And the way I got through that was I tried to sit down and talk with this person. It didn't go so well, but the way I got through it was to recognize that's just a little representation of how I have treated the Lord every day of my life. Yeah. And when you can put it in those terms, then you realize this is why we're in ministry. You know, that there's that common axiomatic statement that goes out, you know, ministry would be great if it weren't for the people. <laughs> but this is why we're in it. Right. This is why we do it. And you are one of the people. I'm one of the people. Yeah. That's right. I'm one of the problem people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So mate, what is the statement? Um, you know, God uses a a crooked stick to strike a straight blow. Right. I mean, it's the most humbling truth about ministry yeah. that he would use us sinners to minister his gospel and his word. And we have to remember that. It, you know, Moses, the Moses striking the rocks, a real deal. Yeah. You know, in anger at the people. Yeah. And he got criticized every day. Yeah. And yeah, what what do we expect? Mm -hmm. You know, th that's a good point that it's not about me. Right. How dare someone criticize me? Get How could they say it. this about me? Yeah. Why don't they love me? <laughs> it's not about you, man. Yeah, I know. We are the broken vessels right. that God chooses to use to accomplish his will but it's not about us. I think I might've said this before on this, uh, on abounding grace. When, when Jesus is walking into, uh, Jerusalem in the triumphal entry and they're praising him, Hosanna, yeah. throwing down their cloaks and stuff. I heard one guy say one time, the donkey knew they weren't cheering for him. <laughs> right. We're right. the donkey. Yeah. It's not about us, man. We right. are the, we are the vessel. We're the instrument that he uses to reach his people, to minister to his people. It's not about us. It's about Christ. So if people criticize us or pile on us, that's okay. Right. We can't take it personally. You have to love to be in this. You have to love people. Yeah. Like that's just one of the greatest qualifications. You have to sincerely love people and understand what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I think that's just vital for this, or you're, you're going to be in it for the wrong reasons or not understand what you're calling it. And love giving them the truth. Because mm -hmm. again, it's not about us. We could defend ourselves in these situations. Oh, you've got it all wrong. You don't mm -hmm. understand. But what are we jeopardizing if we do that and come back at them with the same amount of force that they come at us with? Mm -hmm. We're jeopardizing that person's ability to hear the preaching of the gospel Amen. from us. So important. So right. if you have to take it on the chin mm -hmm. and, and swallow your pride and let someone beat up on you for the sake of that person hearing the gospel from you, it's worth it. That is, that principle right there is so big for leadership. If anyone's listening to this, that, that is something I had to learn. You know, a wise elder told me years ago, he says, when you get these really nasty conflicts and both parties are doubling down. The only way that's going to be solved, and, and this, this shocked me. I didn't like it at first, and I really thought about it. The only way that's going to be solved is if one party is willing to humble themselves and take it on the chin for the sake of the greater good yeah. of that, of the church, the kingdom, and that person. And I found that to be true. I mean, it doesn't mean, now when I say that, it doesn't mean that we take it on the chin in support of sin, right? right? That, that's not what I'm saying. We have to speak the truth in love. But most of our conflicts, if we're honest, that lead to church separation, church splits, are not over some fine doctrinal point, yeah. are not over our creeds and confessions. They're over something stupid yep. that happened that people dug their heels in. They got personally offended. They're ready to fight. They're not going to back down. They're going to take this all the way up, and they have not demonstrated the mind of Christ in yeah. this, right? So that's what I've seen often— and then I think of sort of the, you know, where you really see wolf behavior is like what I see with some of the, make, and I'm not just singling out this movement, but some of the big time CEO megachurch pastors, when you have a sheep who questions a practice in the church, let's say, that's unbiblical. And because he has disrupted the peace, <laughs> right, and the pastor is not being checked at all by elders. What he wants, what he often does, is want that person out of the church. Yeah. And I, again, this is, these are people. These are people made in the image of God. These are people who are called to shepherd. Unless they're a gross heretic, 
I should be willing to go the extra mile with them, love them, because I want to minister, like you're saying, the Word of God to them, and I want it to be heard. And what are you afraid of? Right. People can question anything. Why do you do this? Right. Well, let me explain it to you. Let me explain it. I'm not afraid that they're going to find a flaw in what we've done, or maybe mm-hmm. they will and we can fix it. Yeah. But I'm not, my ego is not so fragile that how dare anyone question something that we do. Yeah. That's a huge red flag. If you can't be questioned. Oh. If you can't be questioned, you're so full of pride, you shouldn't be in the ministry. Unbelievable. You shouldn't be in it, period. Like, you're going to get questioned. Yeah. And you're going to be challenged at points. How you handle yourself and, and how you look at the situation, how you evaluate it for the greater cause of the gospel is what a servant is. Yeah. Right? It's a servant. So I take questions. I mm-hmm. take questions after our second service every Lord's Day. Right. Um, and it, it usually it's about the sermons from that day, but we usually have 10, 15 minutes after the benediction, not part of the service, but after the benedictions, it's open season. You can ask anything you want. It doesn't have to be about the sermon. It can be about anything. Why did you wear those shoes with that mm-hmm. suit? Right. <laughs> it doesn't right. matter because right. I'm not afraid. And my ego is not so fragile. If someone questions something right. and if he has a different interpretation of, you know, obviously not a major point of doctrine, but I really take this passage this way instead of that way. Okay, that's fine. Let's talk about it. And I don't care that it's public. Right. Right. And, and it's, it's a maturity issue in this. I mean, you know, if I look back over 20 years of ministry now, I was, it's amazing that God, especially the sermons I preached up front, I'd never, those poor people, you know, so, <laughs> so, you know but it's amazing he used that. But also, you know, I was totally oversensitive. I, 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 I took everything internally and personally. I lost sleep over it. I, all these things because it was about me. Yeah. You know, and we've got to let that go. Let it go. It's just let it go. Let it roll off and pray for that person. Do good to that person. Serve that person. And remember your greater goal to minister, minister peace to them. Yeah. Righteousness and peace yeah. in the gospel. Yeah. 